an unknown error has occurred. All righty. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Unknown Era Podcast. Um, I'm going to first by saying, hello, I'm I'm Martin Bennett, your host. This fine audio listening experience. Uh, and with me, as always, is Rick Woo! and Roddy. What's up? Um, and so this is the 30th episode of the Unknown Era Podcast, guys. What? 30? Yeah. That's insane. There is like a special name to it. No, it's just thirty, no. right? There will. The, this is like a century sort of thing. Is there like a thir? No, a I thirstery. guess. Thirstery. Thirst. All for all you thirsty I'm, listeners out there. Like I'm, I'm thirsty. Um, <laughs> oh, you said the water's cut off. I'm like, no. That's true. The water is cut off in my building today. Um, which will be fun later. Uh, we have to go pee. Uh, so, shut up, turtle. My turtles in the excited. background. Yeah, I'm happy. Just making a lot of happy noise. To have us no, it's not. Turtles. It's not happy. It's yeah. miserable and shitty. <laughs> Life in a tank must be kind of rough. That's what we should call this. Life in a tank. Life in a tank. <laughs> uh, so, with this being the 30th episode of the podcast, like, it makes me think about reminiscing back to when, like, um, let's see. I started. I started the podcast with. Uh, with Troy, my roommate, mm-hmm. and we did a couple episodes of that, and then when we decided to do it all together, the three of us, then it kind of reformed, and now it's been like we went on a hiatus again. Yeah. Now we're reforming it again. Re-reforming. So, Change is good. So basically, what uh, what we're uh, doing now with this new podcast, or it's still the same podcast, it's still going to be us, and we're still going to be talking about the things that we want to talk about. But we came up with an idea of, like, reforming it to kind of have more of a solid foundation. Uh, So we're not just bullshitting for every single week. Uh, The other thing, too, is that you'd notice that we're not doing it live anymore. This is pre-recorded on a day. What day? You don't know. You don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, So uh, what we decided to do is that uh, we kind of all have different tastes in music, movies, uh, TV shows, and whatnot. And we always, in between, like, doing stuff or when we're just hanging out, we're always talking about, like, oh, do you watch this? Or have you, or, like, have you checked out this? Or, like, making... No, what's that? Yeah, (laughs) no, what's that? Or, like, uh, making references that the other ones don't know about. Yeah. Roddy, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. I mean, that's usually my life, so that's (laughs) But so what we decided to do is uh, we're going to challenge each other and every week uh, we're going to pick like an assignment for the others to watch or listen or play if it's a game or a video game or or whatnot. Um, And then we're all just going to talk about it and talk about what we liked, what we didn't like, what we thought and all that stuff just so that it's kind of like one person who really enjoys it or even if they have never seen something before and they want to share it with the group and then also share it with the listeners and see what they what they think so um i decided to go first and i made you guys i i decided to torture you guys uh as you as you probably have seen the title of this episode involves a a little documentary (laughs) <laughs> called The History of the Eagles, which is a three-hour-long documentary <laughs> about the history of the band The Eagles from mm-hmm. their inception to when they... Uh, well, it's broken up into two parts. Like bas- Basic information is that it's broken up into two parts. Uh, the first part is two hours long, and it's from when they first started getting into music and joined to when they broke up in 1980. And then the second part is, starts in 19... Uh, 94, 94. Mm. and it's kind of like their continuation of when they got reunited and all that stuff. Uh, very, uh, for, for all these things I decided for all of our topics, I decided that I'm going to like go through and like stickler it. So it's like, it was, uh, it was, it was made in 2013. Okay. Oh, right. Little, little, um, yeah. and it was directed by Alison Elwood. Um, it was produced by Glenn Frey and Don Henley, who are the two main Eagles. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's uh, a lot of it's primarily talking head 
uh, documentary. So if you don't know what that means, it's like just people being interviewed. Uh, but the way that they do this documentary is more of a them telling their stories, not being asked questions and answering. It's more of them just telling their story as as it progresses through time. Um, and it has a lot of older footage from the seventy from the from uh, the seventies and eighties uh, and nineties. And yeah, so I guess the reason why I picked it. <laughs> Is because one, I, I I actually really like the documentary. I I love music documentaries mostly because I find that the stories that come. I also love just behind the scenes stuff. I like seeing how things are made and things are how people lives are affected by it. Like I watched, I think I've watched this original Star Wars documentary of how the trilogy was made, which is four hours long. Um, like a million times. I've watched the the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings oh, behind the scenes. Good, that's some good stuff. Because those are feature films. Those are three yeah. hour long. Three hours long for each film. Yeah. Like, uh, and and I love watching those things. And music documentaries are also one of my favorite things, just because I'm not. I'm huge into music, but I my family loved to play. And they were musicians themselves, but I didn't go into that route because I wasn't that talented. <laughs> but so, stupid fingers. Yeah, yeah. stupid fingers. <laughs> stupid Which fingers. Will be softer, no calluses. I, really do. I hate. Yeah. I I do want to pick up the bass again, just because I really like. I, I that was probably my favorite thing trying to learn, mm-hmm. and it's a bit easier in some aspects um, than only four strings. Four strings, and unless you're crazy, there's not really. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, you know, there's not really any chords you need to learn, like on like guitar, and you kind of have to like learn. It's it's a lot more difficult. Um, I could never fit my fingers on the guitar strings. Yeah, like you can't press down, and it just hurts. Oh yeah, my fingers would not go the way it should go. I was like, yeah, it's very frustrating. Yeah. But so, um, <clears throat> music documentary is about like my favorite bands were always interesting. Um, one of my favorites is. Uh, uh, it's the Beatles anthology, which is a ten-hour-long documentary. <laughs> it was broken up into ten parts, and basically a part for every year that they were together, and it covered all their albums and everything. It's really fascinating. Um, and then there's yeah, another like a movement. So it imagine being like a pretty mm-hmm. fascinating documentary. Yeah. yeah, like they're their first boy band with the girls that scream and got crazy. Yeah, it was really weird. first of that kind. Yeah. It's also it's also really cool to see, and it's all from it's they sort of do it in the same way that they did this one, mm-hmm. uh, where it's them talking. Except it it look like when you watch it, you're like, oh, this took years to make. Yeah, they like where they interview Paul in like fifty different locations, and it's just before George Harrison died. Um. So it, it was made in like uh, late eighties, early nineties, I think. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so like documentaries like that always fascinated me just because I love hearing people talk. And, and it kind of reminisced to when I was younger. And, uh, you know, the, it's, it's the exact same as these guys in this movie. <laughs> it's the baby boomer generation telling their tales of like, oh, the, 70, the 60s and 70s, man. Remember this crazy shit? And that's what my family is like when they get together and they reminisce. Mm-hmm. And so it was always, I always loved hearing those stories and... You know, these this band was uh, some of the guys that inspired my family to get into music, and some of my my parents and my uncle's favorite uh, musicians. So uh, I listened to it for years and years and years growing up. Like I, you guys, seen where I lit, where I grew up, yeah. and yeah, it, it might be very obvious that like driving home from school or just going out into the country. Like I'm from. Um, Funny thing is, when I say Northern Ontario, people it's, yeah. from Northern Ontario say, "No, you're not." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I'm from Upper Southern Ontario. <laughs> specific, specific. But like, uh, what is it? Isn't it like ninety percent of Canada's population lives within a hundred kilometers of the border? Yeah. yeah. So that makes sense. So I'm in. I was in that top ten percent that was just, just above, above the hundred, just above. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So I, I grew up you know driving around in my dad's pickup truck yeah that's the one thing when, to this. like hearing eagles for the first time like my, one of my notes was like they make good road trip songs yeah actually like, yeah, yeah like things that you put on and you just like 
go for a ride. Yeah. Yeah, that's the general feeling I got from it. It's it's a bit of that I grew up in a similarly sparse place. Yeah. And the number of times I've heard Hotel California on the radio is just like <laughs> It it just burns you out, and you're like, uh, I cannot listen to the same twenty songs yeah. for fucking ever. And then, of course, once I graduated high school, there was like two radio stations. One was country, mm-hmm. the other one was classic rock. Well, no, not even. Yeah. It was like pop. Oh, but okay. pop oh. from like the <laughs> like from like the seventies, sort of like in this weird chunk of time. Oh, okay. So it's so much Eagles and and crappy 90s music and all right, that yeah. stuff and it wasn't until I fucking graduated high school where they're like we're gonna make a classic rock station and I'm like, like too late yeah too it was like come on late. yeah but so basically I, I kind of wanted to go through the cause it's interesting it's like I wanted to talk about it not just because of the music but then also um kind of of their history but also because we're filmmakers it's interesting to talk about it in a documentary sense but it's also weird because, you know, as a documentary, real, uh, I might as well, we might as well get this out of the way. As a documentary, it's like the simplest documentary ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. the easiest documentary ever. They have every single person that they want to interview, and they have them in, like, one space. Do you really like the really yeah. tight close-up? But, yeah. On the, face. the whole time, yeah. 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 Like really tight. Yeah. yeah and great. then the rest of it is archival footage and photos and stuff. Which is and, like and a bunch of other weird yeah, things. Yeah, like it looks that like they yeah, filmed in, in, like, in time. Like, like in the, contemporary times and then graded to look old. In the beginning, like, I, I that well, or no? well, you like mean with the interview footage. Not an interview footage, but like you know, they talk about like you know when I'm just driving and there'll be like a shot of a car. And oh like, no, yeah, 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 they yeah, use yeah, a yeah. lot of they use a lot of in the beginning and in uh, the beginning of in the beginning of part one and part two they use a lot of like uh, it looks like like royalty free like footage, yeah. stock footage. And yeah, stuff. yeah, I was yeah. like, huh? Weird. Stuff like that they could afford. That they sort of put in there. It's like, oh, when the it went to a really weird place when he was talking about his father and the depression or something. Yeah, that was and interesting. Though it was interesting, yeah, I but was I was like, like, I was watching this thing. I'm like, well, no wonder this is three hours. If it's like, this is my life story. Oh yeah, and my father. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. one of them like before the depression. Short. Like I like the fact that they all come from different walks of life and kind of, and they all like met together yeah. in mm-hmm. L.A. Mm-hmm. L.A. Yeah, yeah, and I like that, and it kind of. I guess you can go too much in like Detroit because I feel like they they moved on from their past and wanted to create a new life for themselves when they went to LA. Mm-hmm. But I did find I found myself most interested in like the first part, and then the second one I was like, okay, cool, like I enjoyed the tension. But the third one I was like, I'm not liking this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, uh, the way it starts out is I what I really like is that like the way that it starts out um, is with. The footage from the 70, it's, I think, 77 is the concert. And it starts out with, like, yeah, we're the Eagles, and, oh, man, being in the Eagles is fun, and like, but we're, like, normal dudes. And then there's that car scene where they're interviewing them after they come out of the concert. Oh, they're talking sort of, like, us and them sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, and they're, yeah. And they're talking about, <laughs> like, relating to or how their fans think of them and whatnot. And then, funny enough is that they talk about how you know they're like oh we could probably get a few more years out of this and like you know bands aren't like they used to be and my favorite line in the whole movie Mm -hmm. is shit don't float yeah and it's like it's interesting that back then bands were like oh we're gonna you know we're gonna do this for like two years and then there was this magical time all of a sudden when these bands were getting popular enough that they could survive for a few years and then, as it's seen later in the film, it's like, no, you yeah, can keep you playing. Can, yeah. There is a revival of, like, people wanting to continue to see this. And it's, like, the past, like, 50 years has been, like, this really interesting time for music where, yeah. you know, there's a lot of new stuff coming out. But it's interesting that, you know, even back then, they're like, you know, an artist might be around for, like, a year or not. And bands might just break up with each other. Who knows? And that, like, they... Not really predicted, but it's funny how it just the the um, they sort of just called it. Where it's like, yeah, it'd be great to do this for you know a few more years. Bands last longer than they normally did, you know. The the crappy stuff doesn't survive anymore. It's mm-hmm. you have to be good to be on top, 
And then that immediately they're like, yeah, this is great. Like being the Eagles was the fucking best until, and then they just go straight to, yeah. And then it was shitty and it crashed down and all this stuff. And then they start from the very, very beginning. Mm Mm-hmm. It's like, until you've been in a band for 11 years and all of the creative attention stuff. Yeah. But also, yeah, I, I couldn't help but be aware. I, I sort of looked into, I didn't actually find that it was them who produced it, but I, I did find throughout the documentary, I was like, this is very much like an also an Eagles product. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, well, like it's yeah, they were, very interesting that way. They were they're... executive producers on it. And this is something that like, if you watch it, as you see, it definitely goes from, um, it definitely goes from, like, you can see that Glenn Frey and Don Henley are, like, really the main driving mm-hmm. points throughout yeah. it. Yeah. And that the way that they talk, it, it's it's funny enough that, like, everybody that they interview throughout the entire film is, like, middle-aged man now, and none of them give a fucking shit. None of them censor themselves. They all speak the way that they want, and it's weird. Sometimes I felt like, like I got the feeling towards the end, like the way that they spoke seemed very like they had it rehearsed. So that's up in my head. I was like, I felt like they were censoring themselves because they they still had like an image to maintain. Yeah, but I yeah. but I think at the same time they're like we can't change the past, so we no like, yeah. This is the way that we've. You can tell like where certain parts of the what they talk about are like. I don't think it's rehearsed. I think it's more. They've, they've really thought like about the this for a while, and they've probably had to... It's another thing where it's like, you know, I'm sure that both of the main guys have had to uh, describe where they started getting into music for the past, like, 30 years. Yeah. They've probably had to tell some of these stories over and over and over again anyways. <clears throat> yeah. so um, like the, the highly publicized events. That yeah. If you're a fan, you're probably going to be watching the documentary anyway. Yeah. So you, you probably heard all of it already some of it like i think it's also then the um i think it's then kind of because that's the problem that i that's the only problem that i have with certain documentaries when i watch them is like if it is the band talking and telling their story Mm -hmm. you know how fully much of it can you believe because it's coming directly from them Mm. which is why i really like and i made a note about this that um I, I feel like the movie is set in three acts. And it's yeah. three hours. Yeah. The first one, I feel like, is you know them getting into music and getting to the point of where they're making their first albums. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that is them, is actually them just being like, yeah, so then this happened and this happened. And then events are more described by the people around them. Mm-hmm. You know, they have, oh, like, yeah, the, they have the... J.D. Souther, who is one of their songwriting partners. And they have Jackson Brown, who's a famous uh, Cal- Southern California musician back in the day, and he yeah, recounts sure. stuff. Yeah, the, and then I having like, like David Geffen, that's a, that was one of the more interesting parts is the fact that I have David Geffen, who like owns so much of the music industry now, and that he was just like, well, yeah, this happened. Like the fact that they got him, yeah, because you would you would think that like certain people, because you know even. Uh, even having uh, what's his name? Do do do. I always try to. That's I wrote down everybody's names so I can remember. Um, Don Felder, who is like one of the last guitar players. The fact that I liked his story. Like I felt like he was like this weird underdog, which from my point of view. But like I know, like no, it's probably different if you're in the band. Yeah. Because he had that one line at the end. We're like, it's all about the music, but then it was, and he started like tearing mm-hmm. up, and I was yeah. like, oh, that's like brutally honest there. Yeah. Well, it's in, well, it's interesting, and I think like that's even where I wonder like how much of it is true because you can see that it's like by the time it reaches the end, um, you know, starting it was like yeah, the music and like we want to yeah. do this and stuff, but by the end it's like yeah we've been doing this for 40 years they like made an album that went straight to walmart and i was like that yeah. changed we're gonna we're gonna they've get changed. there we're gonna get there <laughs> they've but, changed but i just love i just love the fact that they they talk to a lot of people that weren't directly involved in some ways or another yeah like the fact like, that they also interview like who's that guy the producer guy uh they interview uh glenn johns who is their first producer yeah and he made the first two albums 
Yeah, I like that. And he, you know, he worked with uh, The Who, The Rolling Stones, you know, these yeah. guys who are crazy heavy rockers, and he was, he was just very authoritative. And like, I found... no, you're not getting high in the studio, you're not drinking in the studio, I'm not waiting around, you're going to make this the way that it should be. I found, like, when watching yeah. the first hour, like, I really enjoyed just to see, like, the love of music and the creative... Yeah. Like support that they had because like i think my favorite part was like when they talked about jackson brown and how like they lived together and like he paid like isn't that crazy yeah, yeah. That like there's living a in the place yeah place in southern california back in the day and, and that rent was 135 dollars a month well, that's yeah. insane. Well, inflation. And then yeah. they're like, yeah. and then the fact yeah. that the fact that Jackson Brown's like, yeah, I needed subsidized, so I lived in the basement. And I paid sixty bucks a month. Yeah, that was yeah. cool. But like, the best part is that I think it was like Glenn Frey. Are you talking about the, the songwriting? Songwriting. Yeah, the songwriting process where yeah. he said that like with Jackson Brown, like he just constantly played it and played it, and then that's what helped Glenn Frey realize like, oh, this is how you <clears> just do elbow music. grease. This is how you mm-hmm. do it. And I'm like, I en- like I enjoyed that part of learning how they like created their craft got better at it and yeah. like had this like linda and like linda Brown, yeah that talent like uh what's it called jackson brown didn't know it wrote the uh, these days for nico and i was like well this is like one of my go-to songs if i'm like feeling sad and down I'm like you wrote that and the mm-hmm. fact that they use his influence to create take it easy yeah like i found mm-hmm. like i like eagles when they were collaborative yeah because like, they my had favorite eagles. Because they had they had uh, Jackson Brown, they had J D. Souther. They also had uh, Jack Temption, who was another uh, songwriter that they worked with, um, and he helped write "Peaceful Easy Feeling," which is like one of their first hits. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, yeah, I love just seeing yeah the the creative stuff. I also love in that moment where um, uh, he's like, yeah, and you just would go. But he go into the first verse, and then he play that twenty times, and then he do that twenty more times, and then he make another pot of tea, da, da, da. and it's like that's how it is. It's elbow grease. It's just working, working, working. And then you see, then there's footage of Jackson Brown playing uh, "Doctor My Eyes," and then it cuts to J.D. Souther being like, mm-hmm. "Jackson would just fucking play that song <laughs> twenty times. I wanted to kill him. He did the same thing with the Pretender." <laughs> and you can see the different writing I love because, the, because J.D. Souther is a is a songwriter as well, and yeah. his process is probably totally different. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I love that. It's just so real. I used to live the my upstairs neighbor used to be a musician, and he would play the same mm-hmm. thing for hours. That's how they work. That's their process. Well, it, it's I mean, it's Some one people. thing. Yeah. Well, one the, the thing that really just annoyed me was like. Is it good? Well, the one thing that really annoyed me was like it wasn't good, uh, yeah. but also, you, you could at some point in the day you, these days you can put on headphones, uh, and, and not yeah. have you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you can just do it with yourself and not disturb everybody else in the house. Well, there but you go, yeah. in that case, it was like a piano. <laughs> it was like nine a.m. Yeah. <laughs> yep. No, um, and then uh, actually one oh yeah one note I made was. Uh, uh, it's something that Joe Walsh says at the very beginning. It's funny how like they have a couple of funny quotes from Joe Walsh at the very, very, very beginning, and then you don't see him till like an hour into the movie. Um, but he does that kind of long-winded but really interesting quote where he's like, "Yo, it was a philosopher that once said that." Um, it go. It, it's it's funny how you can see how his brain works, where it's kind of like you know, there's a yeah. lot of like the gears are turning yeah, slowly. Like disconnects. But he says that, you know... demeanor and speech patterns. You're like, oh, you're different. Yeah. But you can see yeah. how, like, he talks about how... How do you fit into this? How do you fit in with these guys? Because <laughs> it's Joe fucking Walsh, yeah. man. Um, you know, that life appears to be chaos at times, and, you know, it's just random things happening that you can't control. Yeah, he was Once a... you step back and you look at it, it looks like a finely crafted novel. Mm. And and I love that idea because it's it's very true to life, I mm-hmm. think. And I think like once we reach a certain age, it's gonna look back and be like, Oh wow, everything just kinda fit perfectly. Yeah, mm-hmm. I found Joe Walsh had the for the third act, had the very for me the endearing yeah. story of the third act. Yeah. Well, he had the most growth. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, but it's like, I, I from like a traditional sense, there's like an arc, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like the satisfying arc. Yeah, yeah. well, you're some real shit to yeah, deal with. Yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about that um, <laughs> near the end. Uh, let's see. Uh, what I was impressed by was how much foot. Like, I know that they like had a lot of their concerts filmed. Yeah. Mm. But I was surprised by a lot of like home footage there was. Um, because you know, like when they're talking about, oh yeah, we lived together and like we were working with Linda mm. Rodstad and you know touring with her, and then you see like footage that they were filming together while they were living in the in a hotel and they yeah. had a room together, and you see all that footage, and I'm and I'm wondering like. Did people just film everything back then, or like take photos of everything? Like, like why is, don't we do that now? It's fairly we novel. Do. We do do that. We, we just take, not that way. Yeah, no, it's not that way. Like, like I, I'm always, I, I see that. And I wonder, like, man, should we just be like documenting it depends everything well, with artists, right? They, yeah. they talk about the troubadour and how something's happening every night. Yeah. So like, they're constantly stimulating. Constantly, there's something good to record. Like, for me, like, I used to do that when I had, like, a more, like, active social life. But now since I'm conquering down, trying to, like, do writing and stuff like that, I'm not going to film myself, like, writing or just, like, talking and brainstorming. It's not that visually exciting. Yeah. But imagine as your band... Well, maybe you should do it. So, 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 so the one you make a paper. documentary about yourself. God. I just want to... I want to know who was filming all that stuff. I think somebody had... Just their like, like a, a friend camera. of theirs. I mean, and could... It must have been, like, one of... Because the other thing, too, is, like, you see, like... After every show, they did that whole like, you know, the uh, the third the third after show, and like when they talk about like you know, what it was like to be on the road, and you see that they still have cameras and they have micro they have like tape recorders, yeah, and they're just recording everything. I think that would have been probably like a journalist or somebody doing that part, maybe. But yeah. the earlier stuff with like hotel rooms and stuff, I think it would have been a somewhat novel in the seventies to be like. Ooh, yeah, man, with my camera, like you or know. like maybe maybe they thought like you know we're on the road and we're doing this stuff yeah, like yeah, who knows if this is fun. gonna last so we might as well just like record it. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. I'm sure. Like, like I think anytime new technology comes out, like even with like my dad, like I think he was the one that got the camera. So for that period of time, he was the one that was always recording. Yeah. So they must have known someone. Like, hey guys, guess what I got? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, let's do this. Like, yeah. I feel like that's where it came from. Yeah, like, fucking like it make, it does orders and all that stuff. Like, yeah. it does make me want to like do that more. With like, well, yeah. just it's... like just like filming random things, and I think like now it's I think now it's like sort of not okay, but still okay. Like people, you know, like vlog and yeah, and yeah. take selfies all the time and document stuff that way. But like, I feel like. If you just take out a camera, like like a camcorder, and you just start recording stuff now, I think people are like, what? Mm. This well, is really interesting. It depends on your friends. Because the thing is, yeah. though, from 2011 to, like, 2015, for me, I always, like, for some reason, I just got really gravitated to just recording things. So then my friends knew that about me. Mm. So then eventually I was able to, like, collect a lot of footage from those five years mm-hmm. and, like, record when I went to Oceaga, when I did tree trekking. So, like, I think if it just becomes a norm or part of like your personality and what you do like you could easily do it like if you say you're recording and like oh okay it's just like martin's thing and like like if you're close enough i know you when you're not going to record like you're not going to record me like taking a shit because you're nice yeah right but Roddy, like can yeah, we, yeah no let me get but in like, there like <laughs> it's just understandably knowing too like to also knowing to capture good angles don't be a jerk and be like i'm gonna capture you from low angles so i can see like all your all oh, your yeah yeah, yeah. Like, if you um, wanted to, like, like we were doing the GoPro and stuff like that, like, it's yeah. fine. If you find that this is your artistic muse, then it's just staying that. Yeah. 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 I just think it's, because you never know what's going to happen, and it'd be really interesting to then be able to look back and see that stuff, because I always wonder that where, you know, I'm, I don't really like being in front of the camera too often, mm. like, specifically with, like, photography. Um, but when I'm older... Am I going to be able to look back and be like, oh, look at all that stuff? Or am I going to be like, wow, I would never... Just do the one second a day. Did thing. or took anything. Like, that sort of thing. So, one I don't know. I have a real... There's a... I mean, there's a real disconnect there. For, for me, personally, there's, like, a real split in... Even with, like, photos. I can walk around. I've got a fucking camera in my pocket all the time. I could just be like, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And people are doing that all the time, but... I don't know. For me, it seems to take away something. 
I think it's... There, there's, for me, there's something to be like living in the moment unless I'm doing something that's a bit more momentous that I right, do yeah. want to. Yeah. Like, I know I want to capture this moment. Like, I'm traveling. I want to do this. Or... No, yeah. Like, I think it's a balance. Because initially when I first started, I was like, I could just be watching this instead of recording this. And then towards the end of it, I'm like, I know I just really love that one, like at a concert. Mm -hmm. Like, I just love that one chorus. I just need to hear that one chorus. So I'll I'll record that. And then part of me will also flip it around. So, like, I'll see me with my friend enjoying the moment. Mm. And I just stuff in my pocket. And then then I'm just like, now's just time to dance. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But it's like watching this, I'm like, how lucky is it that they had that? Yeah, true. Because, you know, it's one thing to be like, you know, the. T- just talking and reminiscing, looking at photos, but it's like it's so cool to have then like the footage of mm. of stuff and then the photos. Um, so then let's see. Then we get into then the film kind of moves from you know talking to different people. Uh, you know we meet uh, Linda Ronstadt, who was a big yeah. help in their career. Um, where they then get Bernie Ledden to play guitar for them, and they get Randy Meisner to play bass for them. And that's sort of the first incarnation of the Eagles. Mm-hmm. And it's the 70s Southern California classic, or like, well, now it's classic rock, but then it was country rock. And yeah. that's with like Joni Mitchell yeah. and, and, yeah. and there's the, and uh, Crosby Sells Nash. Um, yeah. That sort of thing. This guy's and, great. And there's the, <laughs> and there's the, the Troubadour, um, which I think is one, one of the cool things, how like, uh, so like Don Henley movie. talks about how he, he saw Elton, John, Elton John's yeah. first American mm-hmm. debut yeah. was mm-hmm. at the Troubadour. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of where everything kind of culminated. Um, it's interesting that they talk about, like, you know, um, that this time, you know, there was riots and war and all this stuff and a big social kind of uh, change going on, you mm-hmm. know, coming out of the 60s. Um, and that that you know it's it's definitely something i think that they look back on and go like we hit lightning in a bottle like we we were right in the moment yeah like i can't remember what time it was or what part of the documentary it was they started going about what was happening in history and why yeah. people might have connected to the music because yeah, like that history was, was shitty that and was then, that was then like peaceful yeah. easy feeling and take it easy were yeah. were songs that like people could listen to while they're driving and realize that like nothing like things aren't as bad as they yeah. feel and they seem like yeah there's turmoil and yeah there's stuff going on but you know just being able to go out and relax and feel free mm-hmm. in a way yeah um yeah. i think that's definitely what it was like i find they were heavily inspired in their younger days yeah 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 well they listened to you know the the beatles were a big thing for yeah, a lot of those artists well at the time mm-hmm. and i think that was mostly like the rock star music thing but then yeah. i think for inspiration for um musically i think they were just inspired by each other and by the people around them yeah and wanting tell. to be better yeah and they eventually became you know they became eagles they be- eventually became one of the best yeah. um so then it goes from you know their first album success from the start and uh what i love about the first album i love the story about like the the like album like how they designed it oh yeah yeah and they had a what is it famous photographer. In the woods. this is where Hen- i get to pull out my little gripe henry diltz and gripe. gary gripe. burden what i've got a little gripe for the filmmakers uh they do a little time lapse in the desert yeah and you fucking see the camera's shadow what was the seven wait what no 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 this oh, is no, like this the is... filmmakers making it in 2013 when oh, the desert. they put a camera in the desert maybe the stock footage but they have just like like, why would you use that? Why would you use that? Well, there's no real place to hide the camera. You could put it just lower. While you're in the just desert. Just lower. <laughs> and it's, you know, or just angled in a, over there. <laughs> <laughs> I think moving they really on. Really care about the stock footage or stuff like that. Like, it was all on their dialogue. And Piss- I think it's more... Piss- I th- me off. I think, the, I think the documentary is more focused on, like... The story, rather than the filmmaking of it. Oh, that's a yes. also I think that's, I, that's apparent. Yeah. Also, I think most oh, yeah. of the I also think most of the money obviously went into a lot of specific things, like getting certain people, uh, yeah, yeah, and then sure. also getting the music that they could because they got a lot of other music that they otherwise. Um, Did they get a little Joni Mitchell? Did they play some? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. They had some Joni Mitchell. They had some Bob yeah. Seger. They had some Kenny Rogers. They had some 
that was early. They had obviously Jackson Brown and all that stuff. No lie, when listening to it, a part of watching it, part of me is like, I want to listen to all these other artists now. Like I find myself like in the beginning because I'm not familiar with them. Mm-hmm. I find myself wandering like, oh, what's like. Joni Mitchell doing or like what's her work and I ended up going to that yeah yeah and Crosby Stills Nash well it was Crosby Stills Crosby Stills Nash David Crosby was in the birds oh. so they did like happy together or actually no was that no that's the turtles uh, the birds yeah, did the, the, the birds did hey Mr. Tambourine Man um they also did they did a few they were like one of those like 60s pop groups um and they basically got Stephen Stills and David Crosby and uh, what's Nash's first name? I want to say Steve. That does Kevin. seem real, but Steve Nash was not. He's, no, the he's basketball a basketball player. player. <laughs> Kevin, yeah, that guy. No, something. <laughs> but um, uh, they were originally uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, and uh, Neil, not, Neil Young was in the group. Did they not add him? They, I think they. Or did. was he the original? I forget if he added him or if he was original, but he was only there for like a little bit. Yeah. Most of their work, his, most yeah, of their yeah. work is the three of them, and then he did like a song or two. Yeah. So. Um, and then he did his Neil Young thing, which was awesome. Yeah. That was definitely someone that went on and did like their own shit. Um, but what one thing that I I I like about the beginning, it's something that I want to bring up because it brings up stuff later. Is the is the argument that I hear some people say when they're like, "Oh, I don't like the Eagles. It's all it's just country, classic rock, or whatever." That first album, though, sure, take it easy, sure, peaceful, easy feeling. It's like this, you know, country, like soft, mm-hmm. sort of like ooh, you know, driving in a truck thing. But then you got Witchy Woman, total offshoot. You have to admit, and, yeah. And every album, that, what I love is that there's always different things they either do something really soft and nice or some really rocked out which led to then people leaving the band yeah, <laughs> because right, some people yeah. wanted to stay country like bernie Ladin wanted to stay country mm. and stay sort of underground in a way he wasn't ready for success and that mm. sort of stuff um i think even though i love the desperado album i think that album was probably the one that people like get turned away from mm. because it is a lot of country it's like it's cowboy themed it's full out on cowboy but it has some amazing songs um uh what else then happens they then move on to talk about uh crazy after parties they get uh uh probably one of my favorite characters in the whole film other than joe walsh which is uh uh irving azoff their manager oh yeah irving azoff was he he's I love the fact that we first see him and it just cuts to a photo of it. It just like has footage of him and you just hear his voice and it's him like back in the seventies with like huge hair, huge hair. Huge and beard. he just, and he just has his coat over his shoulder. He's just walking to the camera and then he flips it off. <laughs> it's like, that's a manager. That's exactly what I, that's exactly what I want to see. And he, from the interviews, he sounds like such a nice guy, but yeah, you can tell like he's very like, reasonable. He's like, no, I'm a manager and I'm going to do what I can for my artists. And yeah, and like the fact that he was, you know, getting drunk and high with them, you know, during those parties and, and after every show and stuff. Um, yeah. And then they always added... have to manage. Hmm? You don't always have to manage the band. It's like when they're touring. I mean, you set up what they have yeah. to do, and then you can go party. Yeah. Because yeah. well, the other thing too is it sounded like he he knew that they need to get things out of their system. He knew that they needed to do certain things in order to keep being creative and being the guys that they were and the guys that was make, were making monies and selling shows. Mm. So, um, and then, uh, they start getting more Rocky and then, uh, uh, Felder joins and it's still the five of them. For a little bit. Mm-hmm. And Don Felder, like, it's interesting that Don Felder is one of the more interesting people, mostly because it's it's funny how from the very beginning they're like, oh man, this guy can play. Oh, he's so good. And he is very musically talented. Like, he is an amazing guitar player. It's just funny that then, like, the ideals of being in a rock group is what, it's not really, that's the thing. It was the only creative, like, divergence from any of them was just, was Henley and Fry and Frey. Because they both, you know, 
had been writing together and playing together for so long that they wanted to go off and do other things. But all the other band members were, it was more or less that it was what is a band Mm -hmm. that broke them apart. And like Joe Walsh is clearly, you know, what is good for the Eagles? Yeah, he says it a lot. What is good for the band? Because, God damn it. I really hope that doesn't keep going. Fuck me. So there's... Hopefully that doesn't come through on the on the mics. It probably will. Uh, it, it will. Definitely will. There's random construction in my place sometimes above us. And they just... They keep doing the same sort of things. And we never know exactly what it is. It's really annoying. So that's great. Um... Some drilling here, some yeah. drilling here. Yeah. I'm just gonna randomly yeah. drill here. Um, but so, uh, yeah, because it's clear like Joe had been doing his own thing for a while. Yeah, that's and like he, you know, he was in. <laughs> Dear God, he was in the James Gang, and they yeah. made like Funk Forty Nine, Rocket Mountain Way, and all that yeah. stuff. And then he did his own thing, and Dear God, <laughs> <laughs> and. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that he... This is ridiculous. It's getting closer. Motherfucker. Like, (laughs) seriously. But so... (laughs) I literally can't continue this topic. This is ridiculous. I really hope that you can hear it now on the microphones, because if not, we just sound ridiculous. We're just, like, suddenly stopping laughing. They have to hear this loud. They have to Yeah, it's loud. Um, Unless we get real close to the mic. No, it's okay. It's getting farther it's right away. Here. It's getting farther it's away now. Away. Yeah. Um, but you know, the next one is just gonna be like, nah! <laughs> uh, see, it told you. Um, but anyway, so what I want to say was that you know, Joe, it was clear that he was more of a communal guy, but he didn't put himself above the band. what was good for the band while Felder. You know, I think the I think the thing that it it's clear when you see like Don Henley and Ben Frey talk and then Felder talk, mm. where they all sit in that kind of relationship. Yeah, there's a hierarchy, and you can tell but, who's at the top. Yeah. 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 Rod, you mind just moving the clip? Yeah, it's a of, little closer to your face. It's towards the end of the document. Not that close. Well, I'm this far. This is how I'm leaning back. Okay, right? that's fine. Yeah. Like, I think it's like the endish of the second half where he's like, "A band is not a perfect democracy." Yeah, yeah. it's more like a sports team. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a really yeah. Great, that's a really great thing. Where not it's, everyone gets to touch the ball. Not everyone yeah. gets to touch the ball. I was like, man, ball. they really love their metaphor. You're like, oh, but also, oh, I mean, I think a lot but of. But it's what, true though. Not everyone does. I think a lot. I mean, what's interesting about band documentaries and listening to bands and following like what's going on within the band is just the fact that it tends to be very egotistical people what's up do you just want to angle it towards you more wait can I just twist the arm we twist it oh okay there we go yeah there you go that's there you go yeah that's good uh yeah fairly like egotistical people running the band like wanting to get to a place of success like wanting to get here yeah. It's like, it seems like the Eagles, when they started out, they were already, I mean, this is true of a lot of bands probably, but it's like, they, they were talking about like entering the space and like, we're going to record where Led Zeppelin was recording and like, now we're going to get, we're going to get there. Like yeah. fucking come hell or high water, we're going to fucking get there. Yeah. And so it's like, it seems like, yeah, the two big driving forces are doing that and everyone else is kind of like, I like to play music and they have that really but, sweet moment with Joe Walsh and who was the guitarist again? Uh, mm. Well, there's Bernie Ledden, who is the dude with kind of the fro, who then later was very bald, bald and stack and huge. Yeah. <laughs> no, not that and guy. Then, and then, then with the long hair, Randy. No, no, he was the bass player. Randy Meisner was the bass player for no. the longest time. No. Um, it's it's. Uh, well, F, no, it's it it's, it's, it's Don Felder. Okay, yeah, yeah, he's the guy that like they that like him and Glenn Frey are the rift that basically broke the camel's back. Yeah. I would love to see that in real life, no lie. Is like, it? I would love to be at the concert to witness that rift. But anyway, yeah. so what are you saying? They're well, really there was the moment where they're like, Joe and, is it Felder? Yeah. Playing, they're playing, uh, it's the end of Hotel California. Oh, when they're talking about like, the how, like. Yeah, they're talking about like, them playing, them together. playing with each other. And like, yeah. that 
That seemed to me to be like the most functional part of the Eagles. <laughs> Well, it's it's like just these two musicians just doing that. But it's interesting when you have a band that's like, like take for example the Stones. Mm -hmm. Look at that band, and you're like, <laughs> okay, who were the, you know, creative forces behind that? Yeah. You have, you know, Mick Jagger, who's the writer of everything. Yeah. And and then like they said in the thing, like uh, Glenn Johns was tired of the Stones coming into the studio and at the end of the '60s, and having to wait for Keith Richards to go into the basement and wait till he played something that he liked and then come up and play it and then Mick would be like, All right, let's like let's write a song to that. And like so you have like main creative forces and everybody else does just their job. While yeah. in this band you have two creative forces, but they're not just like the front men. Right. One plays the drums. Yeah. Which normally is just a very functional part of the band. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in some bands like them and um the band. The band. <laughs> the band. And there's a... I think there's, like, another, like, one or two bands that have, like... Rush! <laughs> front. Well, he just... He just plays really good drums. Yeah. Uh, there's another... But I think there's some other ones out there where this, the drummer is the singer. Then it, like, the dynamic is really different. Because then you have people... You have more people that are, like, more forward, but they're still doing their main functioning part of the band. Mm -hmm. And... You were thinking, oh, well, now can't I be the front person for this one? Because then you have Joe singing the song, and then you right. have Randy Meisner doing Take It to the Limit, which was their first number one single. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would say, I do agree that, like, you know, if I was Felder, I'd be like, okay, where's my thing now? Yeah, like, yeah. I understand where he's coming from. Yeah, but yeah. it, but I think there does need to be a for sure leader in that in that sense, because you can't have... Yeah, everybody trying I think to be a leader. It came to a point where contracts are very important. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, which is awkward, eh? Yeah. So and then like they learned and, that and the later whole, in their career. Yeah, but yeah. because of the whole, uh, you know, they're they're signed to Asylum Records, and then David Geffen sold Asylum to Warner Brothers, mm -hmm. and so what happened was, um, uh, when artists joined Asylum. Um, he set up everybody to have their own publishing company um, because in I, I do like that they talk very honestly about the music industry and like you have these guys who have been like the biggest force one of the biggest forces in you know a certain area of the music industry for so long and they're like yeah record companies are pieces of shit <laughs> like yeah they help us but at the same and it's very art it's it's very artist yeah, it's, oriented. It's, like there's obviously way so many other aspects to oops, so many other aspects to how music is made. But from the artist standpoint, they're very honest about how it went from how like the '70s to now have completely changed. But still, that keeps happening is that they shortchange certain things. Yeah, and that you know, Geffen was like, no, have your own publishing rights because then at least you own half of them, and you know you're getting money, and it's smart of him but then i can't tell if the movie wants to try to play him off as the villain i think it still does i think yeah because then it's like you know oh yeah and then i sold it all because yeah and then like we were stupid kids who didn't know anything about contracts or deals or anything and so we were screwed out of it mm -hmm. and that you know he gives jackson brown all of his publishing rights back but warner brothers gets the eagles gets all these other people's publishing rights so they own half of them um, and they're just sold off to a company that's, you know, they never wanted to be. Um, I think the Eagles are pissed off by that, but I think, I mean, it makes like a business sense. It makes, giving, a, it makes a business sense. And yeah. giving Brown his rights back. Like he says why he did it. Yeah. He's like, He's like he put me in contact with all of these musicians. Like yeah. I owe him. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah, everybody else is like, well, what the fuck? What about ours? <laughs> yeah, well, then, where's my right back? It's like, well... And then later in, the, later in the film, they talk about, like, you know, how the Greatest Hits album, which is, I think, 71 to 75, something like that, 71 to 77, maybe, um, was rewarded with... And the reason why it doesn't... I, I know why it doesn't show up on most selling albums ever. Because when you look up that list and it shows Thriller as like one of the top, mm -hmm. is that's because it's studio albums. While that was a compilation album, yeah, yeah, that's why. So the greatest hits 
of the Eagles, 71 to 77, I think, is the most selling uh, album of the 20th century. Um, Compilation album. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, no, it was. No, like, it, it's like, the, it uh, is the most selling album. Like, oh, like okay. of all time. It's of just that when albums. you look up, when you try to look up most selling album, it will, j- they'll filter it mm. and it'll just show studio album. Okay. Because obviously it's like, you know, this is all of their greatest hits while like Thriller is the most successful single selling album because it's not like past work. It's all no, yeah. original yeah. work. So that's why. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah and and even with that they say like you know because they had that in in the late 70s like yeah this thing was selling like insane but the record company was not like oh we're gonna up your royalties no you're still gonna get the same thing you got five years ago yeah um that sucks so it's cool to see that uh i think my favorite part of the entire film is when joe gets into the band yeah and who think they got? They talk about all of his stuff. I, like I got confused about who was who was coming in, who was coming out. Yeah. Even though I know it's not very confusing, I was like, or they just didn't show enough of that guy. It's basically it's basically it was Bernie Ledden was the first guitar player. Okay, and then they got Don Felder, and then they replaced Bernie. So they had three guitar players now. Okay, they had Glenn Frey, who was lead singer yeah. for a while, um, Bernie Ledden mm-hmm. and Don Felder. Mm-hmm. Then Bernie left, and they replaced him with Joe Walsh. Okay. They didn't kick Bernie out. Bernie left. Bernie, yeah. Well, there's, like, with everybody, kind of, when, whenever they talk about um, someone leaving, it's always, it is always a kind of, uh, it's a bigger spectacle than I think it ever was, but that's when uh, they're talking about making On the Border, I think it was. And, or it's one of these nights. I forget which album it was. But, like, they started getting more rocked out. And uh, Bill Sismic, who is their second producer, mm. who, um, he he was, a, he was a fucking, uh, uh, was it, he worked on submarines in the Cold War. And he, and he was an audio engineer for them. Like, trying yeah. to find German submarine, or Russian submarines. And like That's then awesome. he just got into music because he had a lot of audio experience, and then eventually he grew up from being an engineer to a producer, um, which is a really cool story. And I like that they interview him a lot, and he has a lot of a different side of it, like a spectator kind of side of it. Mm-hmm. But um, he talks about how they're working on a working on a, a track, and uh, Leden hadn't said anything. And he's like, what do you think, Bernie? And Bernie just, like, stretched and was like, I think I'm going surfing, and then left. And then they were at a show, and I think, and was a phrase talking about how, yeah, he was animated, and they're talking about what they want to do next or whatever, and that Bernie walks over and pours a beer on his head and tells him to chill out. Right, 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 right. And right. it was clear that he wasn't... He's not, not down for this anymore. Down for the success and down for the yeah. spectacle. Right. Um, so... I like so that. Then and, then, and then they got Joe Walsh because Joe was someone that they looked up to, and they're like, "That guy is a rock." Yeah, that guy is a rock guy. I would guy. like He's to a know guitar player. More about Joe. And well, I would have liked to know why Joe was like, "Yeah." The Eagles are the Eagles, and nothing. I don't know because well, because well, he was doing his own stuff before. Maybe he was, he was just, just like, "I guess I'm ready for this again." I think. I think. I something. think definitely was that he had a creative outlet that he was working on his own stuff, and he made you know. Um, Life is Good and a couple other albums. I think what it was is just that, like he says in it, he's like, <laughs> he's very honest, which I really love. Mm-hmm. I like I like how honest he is about a lot of things. And, you know, he talks about how um, the entire time he was with those guys, he was scared and his anxiety was going crazy. And, yeah. he, was like, like, and he was hiding behind it all with humor and that he looked up to those two because he thought mm-hmm. that they were amazing yeah. songwriters. Yeah, like he idolized that. Every time he spoke yeah. with them, it was like he they were their, his idols. Yeah, yeah. which is funny because it was like sort of initially the opposite. Yeah, because yeah. they're they're like this guy is a rock god. We yeah. need him. Yeah. he will legitimize us being rock stars. Yeah, and then there's the whole story about. I love his stories. His story. I would love to listen to him just talk to tell stories. Like he talks about Keith Moon and saying like. The worst part, the worst part was that Keith Moon said that he liked me, because <laughs> Keith Moon was just known for being an animal and 
destroying everything in his path. Um, they talk. He talks about being with John Belushi in Chicago, and oh, that story. Yeah. They had to go to a. Spray they had to go. They they were like, let's go to a fancy restaurant. They went in there and they were trying to bribe the major D three hundred dollars to let them in, but they wouldn't because they were wearing jeans. So then Belushi went and got spray paint and spray painted their jeans black so that they could go in. And then they sit down and the ink and the, and the paint starts bleeding into the really nice like Neil point chairs. So then they bail. And then they proceed to break the world record for, or make the world record for most room trash. Yeah. Which was $28,000 back in 1970-something. But then he go, went on to say, he's like, it was in, my insecurities that yeah. mm-hmm. resulted in that violence. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, he's, like, well aware of that time and why he did the things he yeah. did. Yeah. But, but then it's really funny that um, uh, Irving Azoff and the other members are like, but we understood why he did it. We understand why he did it, and because, and and Irving says like, and I understand why, like, yeah, sure, Glenn and Don didn't like it, but they did let him do it because they knew it legitimized them as a rock band, huh. and like it 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 was something that Joe did to get shit out of his system, <sighs> uh, basically. Um, and then after, so that's like this, we're now in the second half of it. Um, is that before we'll probably barrel through the third half? Cause it's not that there's not too much to talk about with the third, with the third part, but, um, well part two, but the third kind of act. Um, and the second act is mostly just them. They broke up cause of, I mean, the, the, yeah, well it's, it's all about songwriting. And I think what Joe Walsh put the way he puts it the best is like, we were all alphas and like, yeah. and like, you know, but then he mentioned some people that weren't alphas. No, um, yeah. Well, uh, he wasn't an that's alpha. why that's why Randy Meisner left was because he wasn't an alpha. He said something like that. Yeah, he says he wasn't alpha. He wasn't. He, he didn't like confrontation and he didn't like you know doing that stuff. And and what the main thing about that was like, and, and why I liked it is that you know they make Hotel California, and that's the beginning of one. It's amazing that they made it, and I love that Bill Simsnick, uh talks about how. You know, he feels like that was when Glenn Frey and Don uh, Henley became true songwriters. Mm. And then they talk about, you know, all the theories and stuff about that people have come up with about Hotel California and trying to make a meaning that's not there. Like, it's bullshit. And, and, well, um, I remember reading it said something about it's a fine line between American Dream and American Nightmare. Was that the whole general feeling of it? That's when, that's what happens during, yeah, that's, that's what happens during the, the making of that album. Yeah. Is uh, is they start to tensions start to run high because they don't want to waste their time on stuff that isn't going to be good. Mm. Um, and but it but I love how Sismic talks about how uh, you know yeah it was a seven minute single mm-hmm. and they gave it to the record company and they're like no you have to cut it down they're like no take it or leave it and they took it and then it became in, insanely successful. Um, yeah, and that was the, the start of the falling out. Um, and Randy left because he was like, I don't want to, this is something I really like. And, and I don't think it's talked about a lot is that, you know, Randy was like, I don't want to do take it to London. Yeah. I like yeah. that. I thought and, that. And yeah. It was He's a like, refreshing point of view. Like it's later on, I found that the, like, uh, Don Henley and Glenn had a more very business, very job look on their life. While Randy still at that point seemed to be like all about the music. I remember I wrote yeah. his line about like all he said, All I want is five guys just being happy together. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, that's like not what you expect. From but like then a but fan. then it's so interesting that like Glenn's like, I told him, Randy, you know, there's people that are coming to see these shows that have been wanting for years to see you sing that song. You think I like doing Take It Easy and Peaceful Easy Feeling every single night? No, but I do it because these people are coming to see us do it. They're coming to watch us do it. And I think that doesn't get talked about a lot by mm-hmm. other bands. Like, you know, I remember years ago when um, Green Day came out with American Idiot. And they, yeah. they did a documentary. Um, it was more, well, it wasn't really a documentary. It was more of a show. But they had, like, filmed little bits here and there. And it was, uh, I think the film's called Bullet in a Bible. Because they filmed in... Germany and they visited an old war museum. Oh, yeah. Something yeah, yeah. like that. And uh, they talk about, you know, 
like long view and like some of their original songs and that now they're starting to see that when they play their old stuff from dookie that they'll look down and see people that don't know what they're playing Mm -hmm. and that that's kind of weird to them and they're like well maybe now our classics aren't really the thing we should be doing anymore right because maybe our audience has changed or you know people just don't know what we used to play Mm -hmm. and um but i think for like my music taste wise like i prefer i prefer like an artist that will do like a whole album that's really good and not rely too much like on the older hits because one thing i felt about this like again when we get to the third act i felt like they turned into like that generation's like cold play or like Coldplay initially started off with like Yellow and whatnot, and now they kind of just make album after album where like it's fine, but like there's like nothing really there. Yeah, but I mean more of like the, like how he is like you know people want to hear what we used yeah. to do, mm-hmm. and they want you know they want to because back in the seventies is like you know you either listen to the record or you manage to go see the band live like completely. You can't watch. Them. Oh yeah, you can't watch time. them yeah, play yeah, it's a time. unless maybe they you know appear on TV or something. Mm-hmm. You never know, but. Getting to see a band live was, like, huge back then. Um, and so, you know, people are paying to come see you do this song. Sure, you well, you did it four years ago, but they want to see you do it. And that's what eventually leads to him leaving, is, yeah. you know. Um, it's, it's interesting. Like, it showed yeah. both... Like, for me, I can understand both sides of you. Like, yeah. for some reason, just my personality gravitates towards Randy's more. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I can understand both point of view. Like, again, like when you said of that being that time going to the concert, paying for the concert. Yeah. Like, as an audience, like, you really want to. But, like, and now in these modern settings, like, I'm used to, like, not an artist not playing their old hits. It's just, it's just a given. Yeah. So, like, it's back then, it's more like it just had to be. Yeah. It's it, weird. It, it would have been nice because there's a part where Joe Walsh was talking about that, and he's like, he's like, Randy could do it, yeah. But if you made him do it, it was like different. He like felt more insecure about it or something. But it would have been nice if they were like more compromising in that way. They were like, yeah. Randy, how you feeling about things? Like, do you want to do it tonight? And he's like, Yeah, yeah, I want to do it tonight. That could have happened instead of being like, Nah. Well, it's, it's, well, it's the sort of thing where it's like they would just have it on the set list. Yeah, that's the you thing. know it's going to be on the set list. It's yeah. their number one single. Like, yeah, of course it's going to be on the set list. And I think that's where there's an interesting balance between a musician, a performer, and a businessman. And yeah. like that's yeah. where yeah. like it all pollinates together. It's like. You know, being a musician is like playing the music for the music, and like Randy could fucking hit those high yeah, notes, and goddamn, sure. is he not an impressive fucking singer? Yeah. Um, especially when you listen to that song, you're like, holy shit! And you listen to some of the other songs that he did, um, uh, and then being a performer and businessman kind of go into each other, where it's like, we're trying to make this show perfect for the audience. Yeah. But it's a business decision because. That's what's gonna bring them here. More money. So it's it's a weird amalgamation of like all those little things together. And yeah. That just took them out of it, and then they got Timothy B. Schmidt. Which yeah. the funny thing about that whole thing is, Rand they found Randy from a band called Poco. Which they also pulled Timothy from. Which they also pulled Timothy from because uh, Randy was in Poco and he was singing the high notes and playing bass, and then after Randy left that band, that band found Timothy B. Schmidt. And he was playing the bass and hitting those high notes. And then when, <laughs> when Randy left, they're like, "Oh, well, let's we, oh, grab this guy." <laughs> and uh, I do like that um, Irving and Glenn talk about the, you know, finding Timothy. And he's like, you know, it's, you know, gack. I think the quote is gacked out and like just drunk in a bar somewhere. Oh right, yeah. And Glenn says. If you had been playing with the same band for and playing the same songs for eleven years, making fifty bucks a week, when you want to be, like, drunk and fucked up in a bar somewhere, yeah. And then they didn't even audition him. They just were like, "No, come in and play," because we know you're good. Hmm. And he was just a kid, basically. I mean, like, 
yeah of course yeah why would i not do this yeah like every time they had his talking head it was like literally a grin like from like ear to ear because <laughs> he, he was, was just like happy to be there yeah exactly yeah. but he got plopped down into the shit yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah he Thanks. got plopped down into the shit he he didn't know what he was doing um or he didn't know where he was at but he but he managed to make um God, he has like such a positive attitude though. yeah and, like, he, he, was, and like, he managed oh, to make this, uh, he managed to make like some really good like probably their best like R and B hits, like he did. Um, he wrote and sang. Uh, what was the one from, the long run? I'm trying to remember, because it's the one where he does it and then do- he says that Don Father came up to him and was like, "There's your hit." I'm trying to remember what this was. No, oh, I know what you're talking mm-hmm. about. Like I remember with them talking. I can't about just it. tell you why. I think that's what it what is. It? I can't remember. Every time I wanna walk away. It makes me turn around and say, and I can't tell you why. That's it. There we go. Yeah, that's right. And then later he did. Then later when they rejoined, he did. Uh, um, oh, something. I forget. He did another love song, mm-hmm. and it's like a really R and B, like just calm and cool and stuff. Um, and yeah, I think he was a really good. He was probably the best place that they could have gone after losing Randy. Um, but yeah, he got plopped down in the shit, and like tensions were high, and everything was happening. Um, they talk about doing the long run, and like how that took forever, and they were all fucked up on cocaine and shit, and and like that was the only way that they were getting through it all. And I love uh, Joe Walsh saying, and I think there's probably some artists out there that really feel like this, where it's like, you know, it didn't matter if we burped or farted into the microphone and recorded it. When can they have it? Mm-hmm. That was the only thing that they wanted, and 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 you know, it's not just like oh, this is the they just wanted whatever. Yeah. But he then says because that was their entire fiscal quarter, right? Was whatever they made next. So, yeah, um, it scans the end and then the breakup. Yeah. Which was which was what you, was what you said I, I do agree to. I would have loved to have been at that show. Yeah. I would have loved to have been at the show just to see. It was just a benefit show, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was for just for a senator because he it was said for, something it was about for, like I th- what he said. I think so or something. No, it, it, uh, what thank it was, you, I guess. I guess there. We go, what yeah. it was it was for Senator Al Cran- Alan Cranston, and he was um, wanting to talk about the environment and a lot of other things. And uh, uh, Don and Glenn were very supportive of him, and they saw like, you know this is someone that we actually want to back. And I guess they were asked, like, do you want to play at this benefit? And they said, of course, why not? Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously they're kind of more of the voice of the band. So yeah. they go in there and I'm sure Walsh was probably like, I don't know what, I'm just going to play. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to play. Yeah. And yeah, when, uh, at this, uh, press conference, he, that the Senator then went up to each individual Eagle and said, I want to thank you for coming here. And being here, and when he got to Don Felder, Don said, "Thanks, I guess, or you're welcome, I guess." Mm-hmm. And that just, just like so, Glenn Frey, it just was the culmination of everything that he had been starting to just hate about Felder. But that's... that it was like you're ungrateful. You just want to, you want your own way. Because on on Hotel California. Felder was very adamant about like, hey, I want two songs that I'm going to sing, but he never wrote anything. He mm-hmm. just like made he he was like the Keith Richards where he would like spend time and make music and chord progressions or whatever, and then send it to them. And while like for, um, it's taint not tainted love. What is it called? Um, victim love. Victim of love. Yeah. yeah, that's the song yeah. where he's like, that was supposed to be my song, and it's very like possessive yeah. um but then you see glenn and don talk and they're like no one was ever promised anything no one was ever promised anything in the band and glenn talks about how like the reason why i stopped singing part way through the 70s was because we had don henley who's one of the mm. like, the golden voice of 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 rock in that time and don sang everything basically um except for like one or two things um and then, yeah, uh, that just billowed and built up in him. Uh, they were backstage, and he smashed a beer bottle. Um, and then when they got out on stage, the whole time he's just sitting there just, like, staring at him, like, you, I'm going to kill you. And then they actually have recorded audio 
from that concert and you can hear uh don felder and glenn frey just like arguing with it's, each other and just like fighting on stage and it's funny though like the way that the argument like doled out it felt like they just broke the seal and someone just made one comment and then from then on like they could not help themselves yeah. but to just keep on swearing at each other it's like i'm gonna fucking kill you after this like, yeah well, it's what? like it's like you you really know how to handle people don't you and yeah it's like well it's not like as you, uh, you, just pay, you just pay everybody and it's like well i've been paying your fucking paycheck mm. for seven years man yeah. And yeah, and then just like I'm gonna fucking kill you. Like it broke down to that. And as soon as they got off stage, um, I will say though for the film, like uh, in terms of the filmmaking aspect, the editing mm. in this film is really on point. I, I do have to admit, like they know exact whoever was editing this and how they were building it, they knew exactly how to take like music cues and stuff and really build that together. Because like, what's the perfect song to have during this moment? Oh, <laughs> friggin' um. Oh, what's the heartbreak tonight? Of course, there. Oh course, yeah. Because the main line is that, and that is, uh, somebody's, somebody's gonna, gonna hurt, hurt somebody. <laughs> and it's like that's a perfect moment to yeah. have that song and all that. And then, uh, yeah, basically the concert ended. Uh, Felder ran out, grabbed his, grabbed a guitar, smashed it, and then that was it. Yeah. And it's interesting if if the first part was just by itself. It's a really sad ending. It's like, oh, and then these friends just stopped being friends and they broke I up. I really felt bad for Timothy at that point. Yeah, well, he yeah. was only there for three years. Yeah, and he only did he, one album yeah. and he was like, is this really over? And that's yeah. what I love is like, sort of, I guess I'll just, just to jump into part three here. But he's like, once this happened, I just started hustling. Yeah. Like, I didn't know what was going to come. So I needed to feed my fucking family. And yeah. He was like, sung for like, I was on the back Twi- track for like Twisted Sister, Sister. like all yeah. this stuff. It's just like... <laughs> So like, I'm just going to get out there and do what I was doing before. Yeah, exactly. He's like, I just have to keep... Because he wasn't like like the other other people. Like, Joe Walsh then kind of spiraled out and, yeah. you know, was stuck in with being an alcoholic and drugs and whatever. But then uh, Glenn Frey and Don Helder went on and did their solo careers mm-hmm. and started doing acting. And this is when MTV came out. And... Uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny. Yeah. Was and, the acting. Well, Don, Glenn Frey was in freaking Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, also Miami and, Vice. Some boat in man. Miami Vice, yeah. And, plane uh, boat man. Boat man. He's a boat man, right? Was it a plane boat? Plane boat? Was it a plane or a boat? Know. I just assumed he had I like... I think it was a plane. I think okay. we haven't watched enough Miami Vice. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so... And yeah, and then Don Henley went on and did all of his own stuff. Um, and their solo careers were pretty successful. I do like how Don talks about MTV. And it's like, you know, reviewers were saying that a lot of bands... At the end of at the beginning of the eighties, were loitering on stage, yeah, and that the video scene was becoming the whole, well, whatever, and mm-hmm. you know, it was a way, it was a way to reach that new generation and a way to enter in there and get that sort of thing. But, um, they were they were very clear that they're like, no, we're songwriters and recording artists. Artists, we just did it because it was there, it was the way things were happening, and that's how we did. It. Yeah, that's um, a business it's, approach. It's funny that they show, you know, they show like parts of their videos and their solo careers and it's like so it's so cheesy yeah it's really 80s. funny well, it's the 80s <laughs> yeah, yeah no it's the yeah. 80s it's really cheesy you're like ah it's great. was one of them like with candles or something I felt like someone used candles and that was, was like, um, that was Don Don Henley's uh, end, of, <laughs> end of Innocence oh my gosh I could have this like, is yeah. the end of Innocence I'm happy that was a uh, Boys of Summer yeah I really yeah. love like one of my one of my I, I totally forgot when I first watched that documentary that Glenn Frey did The Heat Is On and I was like oh I fucking that's in that's in Beverly Hills Cop and I love that movie and like that's such a good song like uh, yeah no um, so basically the main the main last part is obviously the like part two of the two parts is them coming back together and that sort of thing I feel though that the second part is very disconnected in a lot of ways. It's more of like a very, here's what happened, then here's what happened, then here's what it's. There's no real arc or story, and mm-hmm. like we said in the very beginning, like Joe Walsh's arc is like the main one, yeah, because of him going to rehab, and you know, he's got a, a, you know like different in, perspective on the things he is, that he's, happened. He has yeah. a definitely different yeah. perspective, and you know that they said like um, they were offered a million dollars by. Uh, uh, What's his name? He was one of the guys that started Apple. 
Steve Wozniak oh, okay. mm. to play at a show. They were offered a million dollars to reunite, and Glenn Frey was like, fuck no. Mm. I want to keep doing what I'm doing. And, um, uh, but the fact that, you know, at the end of the, at the beginning of the 80s, classic rock was now a genre. And their music yeah. was just constantly, constantly played on the on the radio, so it was like they never left. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do like that he realizes that. I, I don't think it's it might be in an egotistical sense. I can't really tell by watching, mm-hmm. but I, but I think there is something genuine to it where it's like that they realize that you know people grew up with this music and thus did things in their lives to this music. Mm-hmm. And it's true, though. Yeah. 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 Same thing, like even music now, people can say it was some song that they listened to defined a point yeah. of their life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hotel California is always going to take me back to being like, I don't know, eight or nine years old. So. <laughs> um, and it, then the beginning of this part connects back to the very beginning of the first part, which is the whole like, oh, you know, we probably got a few more years out of this. And then they are very honest and they're like, no, there's a thing of adult rock stars now. The mm-hmm. people that grew up listening to this music when it first came out are now older and want to keep listening to it. And they've shown it to their children now who want to now listen to it again. Yeah. And it's cool how it's like that sort of, that like never went away. And it's still happening to this day. This is, the, is it? Is it? I know yeah, that's for me I'm biased yeah. because like I'm not, their, I'm not their target I don't know. I don't know if their show, I don't know if, show, if their show is already passed or if it's coming up in the summer. Hmm. You know who's playing at the ACC? Who? Tears for Fears is opening for Hall & Oates. And my Facebook feed, when those tickets were announced, went crazy. Well, and it's just... all fucking 20-year-olds who loved listening to those music because that's what their parents listen to. And, like, that's, like, a show. Like, See? Tears for Fears and freaking... I guess I just wonder, notes. like, I mean, like, of our generation, like, if... Because the thing is, it's different know? is, like, for me, what it is, like, when... I didn't even know that happened because nothing of that was on my Facebook feed. Yeah. But for yeah, me, it's, like, a lot of boys to men and a lot of, like... Right, yeah, yeah. No, but thing. that's true. Yeah. Even, like, those groups are yeah. It's like, back. is some 41 going to get another, another... Possibly. Re-emergent? Well, like, yeah, like, Some 41 is playing yeah. again. Blink-182 j- came out with another album. Yeah. But I think there's a thing, though, where, like, is it nostalgia? Like, just, just because think... of nostalgia, is it good? Or is it just because it's the nostalgia that makes it good? Well, that's what I think, like, classic... I'm hoping that classic rock is going to be continuing to be important, because... I think I, so. I didn't get that from my parents, per se. Well, look at look at um, what James Gunn is doing with Guardians of the Galaxy. He's, oh, taking, yeah, he's right. taking 70s yeah. and 80s... Well, not really eighties pop, seventies pop yeah. with like, you know, David Bowie and um, Fleetwood Mac and Earth, Wind, mm. Fire. Yeah, and he's just putting in because he's like, no, True. this is the music that I love and that inspired me to do these things, and it's like what I'm listening to, and like that's what Tarantino did when he made it and he yeah, his true, films. He's true. like, I think of scenes with songs automatically when I'm writing them, and mm-hmm. it's just the music that came there. And as long as that keeps happening, it's like. No, like yeah. the, 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 Thor tra- the Thor Ragnarok trailer was released, and oh, yeah. it, and it has Led Zeppelin on it. But the what? thing is, though, love Led Zeppelin. Like yeah. I found, like like as a person that doesn't listen to Eagles at all, like I just don't hear it's in bits. When I was watching the documentary, like I told you earlier, I I found myself gravitated gravitated towards their beginning, and like when they had the most uses. Yeah, and I found in the third act when I started seeing what they were doing, it felt more of like this is like the business of it. Like, there's some yeah. songs that were inspiration, and, like, a part of me was, like, be like, okay, because there's that one, like, I realize this song is about Iraq. And I was like, what's, what's, yeah. what's but, happening but, but that was the thing, was that the original, their original work, they were writing it about the times. Yeah. And it was, um, it was but it was more magical in the sense of, like... Like a reaction of their... I don't think it was, like, I, their music was not, like, a... Oh, the war. We'll write something about the war. No, it's they like just we'll realized, write a f- about the feeling that's around. Yeah, they realize that what they're making, like I think, Hole in the World is directly like, no, we like nine eleven happened. We'll write a song about it. Yeah. Um, and but I think the way that they make music is like, there's just stuff going on. They write it because of what they're feeling about it. Yeah. Um, with like. Yeah, that's the their final album was uh, Long Road Out of Eden. But and is, uh, that was the one that you said earlier that like 
uh, yeah, they sold it. They did a direct to retail yeah. thing, and they and just it was, threw Walmart. It was very businessy because he was yeah. even said like, "Oh my God!" So like, now they get like two albums for the press of one. I'm like, I would rather have like good ten songs than like double the songs and like none but of them. But it was. Are good. But I it haven't was, listened to it though, so yeah. I can't fully say if I like it or not. There's but some, just, there's some okay songs. But like based on like how they framed it, I was like, yeah. I don't want to listen to that. But it but it did pave the way for like. You know, look at what just happened this last year at the Grammys. Who it was it wasn't was it Chance? Yeah, Chance the Rapper. Who yeah, Chance the Rapper. He just he didn't do any retail. He just gave no, it but that, free. No, yeah. but that's but the thing. It's, the way it's, of that. it's paving yeah. the way to where to take the out middle the middlemen. Yeah, yeah. The middlemen that are controlling the industry are basically being like taken away. It's like mm-hmm. no, the artist can directly go to the audience now and be very popular. No, true. true. Like I agree, but like I don't know. There's something about them towards the end, like the way th- their mannerism and how they spoke. Like this is just like personal opinion, yeah. but like it felt like so businessy. Yeah. And a part of me is like, you've been doing it for forty years. Yeah, like, yeah. And yeah. so like it's just it was interesting just to see the change, like adulting. Like yeah, it, it was, very much so. Yeah, the fact just, that they have families now yeah. and like they focus on that. Like Walsh talking about, you know, getting clean and like that was the like. That Frey was not going to do the reunion unless Walsh got clean. Like they yeah. kind of were like, "You yeah. have to do this if we're going." See, to yeah, do this. I like that stuff. Like that. And, yeah, how how emotional it was for him. Like that was a thing. Like the fact that it wasn't like family or anything else that was going to get him clean, but the music and the band was what was like. This is this is a like the best reason for me to get clean is I can see how. Now, clearly, my best friends are like, Joe, get fucking sober. And but like, the thing that, and because it's affecting the thing that you love probably the most in the world, which is music. Mm-hmm. And, uh. Because in the end, did yeah. they mention how, like, for the, f- the reunion, they were basically in separate rooms? What, oh, yeah. what Felder talks about is that, like, it started well. What it originally started was it started as three, a three it's supposed to be just a three month tour. It yeah. started as the Hell Freezes Over concert that MTV did, which then had an album and they wrote a couple of original songs and then they started to do a tour, and that's where they wrote Long Road at Eden, and so they started doing a three month. Well, no, they did a three month tour in '94. That developed into years. Then they wrote Long Road at Eden, and then they just continued and continued to work. But during the Hell Freezes Over stuff, because they were so busy, they just barely saw each other oh, okay. it wasn't hmm. on a plane or wasn't like going, going on stage, on stage. Mm-hmm. there wasn't a communal thing which is what felder missed oh, and okay. but he really wanted equality he really, really wanted he, there he really wanted like everybody to be even yeah like, back, back to square one but mm-hmm. obviously like you said business came in the way and felder or no uh, henley and frey were like we've had careers for the past couple years yeah we've kept the eagle's name going Tim, say, timothy understands it walsh understands it father didn't understand it and then it basically came down to money and yeah it it's sad to see his reaction but i can understand both sides yeah, yeah. that's what i like a part of me wanted to know more about felder's side just because yeah i just wanted to know about felder's side because like it's it's the whole thing like that's why i was curious because, like, Don Henley and Glenn Frey seem very, like, again, alpha. And, like, he seemed, like, not be able to get that alpha status. So, like, a part of me is, like, wondering, like, like again, like, uh, with this, is, like, so who is, like, is there a side that this documentary is picking up? Like, picking? Oh, for and, sure. And Definitely. Like, which they, side oh, is they it? They produced it. Yeah. Oh, they did? Yeah. Okay. So then yeah, that the, makes it The clear. alphas produced this. Okay, that makes it Which means totally you don't get clear. any more information. I mean, it's very, very lensed. Yeah, because yeah, that's what is. I got from it. I was like, because every time they like Don Henley and Gray, uh, Glenn Frey talked, I was like, they're like always super polished. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. always just like they get the nice shots, and I'm like, this is weird. Like I understand because in the beginning they were the driving force, but then towards the end it seems like they had like eagles. They were like the chokehold of the eagles. Like they were the, they nothing can pass them. Yeah, I think it's a balance of knowing where your place not know your place is but where you excel at and henley puts it good at one point where he's like they're talking about um victim of love and how felder was like i 
have to sing on this and then they recorded it and it didn't meet band standards and i'm and i think band standards probably was frey henley and sismic mm. that think... was probably the three band standard things and so then they recorded henley's track on it and henley says him wanting to you know do lead vocals on a song was if i said i want to do lead guitar on hotel california he's an amazing guitar player and that's where he excels at and it's the kind of thing where it's like as an artist you know you want to explore and do other things or stay where you stay best Mm-hmm. And that's where they all kind of shoved them into, and I think that was the big problem. Yeah, and I think, like, for me, I think I could see how hard that was, because I feel like in the beginning, because there was leeway, I feel like Glenn Don got that chance yeah. to, like, try out new things, because, like, with Jackson Brown, like, they got to, like, have his input, like, you know, play with his songs, and, like, do What's... with it. But then, like, I feel like Don Fel- like Felder was just, just like, well, I guess this is where I'm at, and mm-hmm. there's nothing else I can do. What's funny is that then when they did Long Road Out of Eden, they got Stuart Smith, who, he, he then was their guitar player. Yeah. Like, he would play guitar with, with Walsh. And when they interview him, he's like, you know, I'm not an eagle, but I'm, I like working with these guys. And, like, yeah, I'll play guitar on Hotel California and these other songs where, you know, I've got to do the solo. And they're finally crafted solo. They're not my solos. But, you know, when I came in to play with the band, I then wanted to, you know, have some creative input. And then you can see on the long road at Eden, there's some songs where he's credited with songwriting and playing and these other things. And so you wonder, like, well, why then wasn't yeah felder put into that? But it might just be the personalities and the grouping of it. Where, yeah. like, maybe Stuart Smith... No, I think I'm getting his last name right. I can't remember. Yeah, it's fine. It's definitely Stuart something. <laughs> um, but you can see that he has the understanding of like, this is where my place is and this is where my job is. But then he has the ability to kind of come in and be like, well, maybe we try this or whatever. And maybe mm-hmm. they were at a different point in their life where they're like, well, we're writing these new songs and they get inspiration from him. And they're like, he's an amazing guitar player and he's an amazing song writer so maybe we can get bring no, him yeah in. like i think yeah. like what possibly could get into that is that like felder had that experience i find and so like it's hard to get away from that experience i mean they they yeah. had a national fight that was live and that forever it it will be part of your life that you will remember yeah and with the Stuart guy it's like he's able to detach himself from it because there is no personal feelings yeah so maybe that's yeah. why i could see them allow him more creativity because yeah. there's no hard feelings but if it's felder automatically i assume like at that time glenn would be like this fucker what's yeah. what really struck me overall is that there there are a lot of moments where they should have talked with each other that's and true. apologize yeah. for the that, shit that, that they've the done big thing, and it? they never did no yeah. and like maybe and, when the beer was poured on the head i think he said he like went over he like apologized afterwards or something or he says no, that uh, he's sorry in that um, moment on camera but he, he says he's sorry in that moment on camera he says like that was that, that that's um that's bernie Lennon. he's yeah. like no that, and that was i i now know that like that was wrong me trying to demoralize him yeah, yeah. but the other guys never say that about all of the other shit like they basically kicked two guys out of the band yeah. and they didn't even like they didn't even bother to try to compromise or to talk no. things through and, like, and, and I selling think, their friendships short I think and and Frey does say at the end like you know in the 70s I handled everything poorly <laughs> yeah but I think and then he's like but now that we're this group I think we're doing okay mm. um and you know they are one of the most successful bands in rock history um you know with so many classics and everything uh it's it's just i love seeing how everything went and you know it'd be interesting to see a lot more real talks with people that were around yeah Yeah. more a little bit Um, less like when it gets to later like it's a lot of that at the beginning but it'd be interesting to see a lot later but you know this is the band that uh, had been around for so long and managed to get a revival and a second chance and they you know keep kept playing for years and years and years basically up until last year when glenn frey actually died mm-hmm. he died of cancer um and yeah now the eagles are definitely no more but um and you know it's sad and 
But it's interesting to see how this band has impacted people in a musical sense, I think. And this documentary is a really interesting look at them personally, but... And it was really focused on them and their lives and the what they did. But it'd be interesting to see then hear more people talk about how they affected the world in a way. In oh, terms yeah. Of music. Yeah. Having like modern music. Like, sorry. Because <laughs> they are modern musicians. Be- yeah. <laughs> because, because of like knowing my uncles and like one of my uncles, the Eagles is his favorite band. Mm-hmm. And he was so happy a couple of years ago to be able to see them live for the second time. Mm. He saw them live when, you know, it was the hell freezes over tour. He's like, I never thought I'd be able to do this. Like he grew up and listened to them and never thought he'd be able to see them live. Mm. And they saw them once and then they stopped and they came back and he's like, I see them for a second time. Holy shit. Like this is the most amazing thing in my life. Um, and it was something that it was a band that, shaped him and um you know there are only some few of those bands come around once in a while Um, oh yeah they they had they made an impact in the music industry for sure yeah and you know i think documentary definitely does capture a lot of that i think captures the time more than anything the time that the music was made and how it was feeling and uh i think it does a really good job at that uh and being able to tell the story of who these guys were and what they did. Yeah. Um, What I think I liked about it is that it really portrayed what it is to start off wanting to be a musician, being just about the music mm -hmm. and seeing what, how that actually progresses as you grow up, how the industry and how how the industry changes you and how you change the industry, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like they, like, they really are not the same people as they started off with. No, completely. And so, like, I thought that was just very interesting. And, like, to see, like, and even, like, adapting, and, like, even trying to create a new sound, how difficult that is. Like you said, I really do wish they had more fan perspective. Because, like, doing additional research on the Eagles, just judging on, like, Rick's reaction to when you first announced this. Like, for me, I didn't really know what it was. Like, yeah, they're that one band at Hotel California. But you had, like, a gut reaction. <laughs> <It's> like, no! <laughs> yeah. So I was like, there is a divisiveness in the Eagles. Like, people say they, they're the worst band ever or they're the best band ever. And I find that's an interesting take that I would love to have seen. What were people's reasons? Like, were they originally fans and then did not like their, proje- like their trajectory? Mm-hmm. Or were they just because, like, that's what my dad likes. I don't want to listen to what my dad likes. Yeah, yeah. dad, you get shit tasting music. Yeah, it's was it one of those? Because <laughs> yeah. I would say, yeah. like, if I didn't watch this from the beginning, seeing Take It Easy and or Take It to the Limit, I wouldn't be as impressed with them in their later works. Because I found the later works and I was like, what is this? Mm. It's yeah. like, I was just walking in the woods. I really love these woods. And so oh, well, the woods, I'm going right. to sing about these woods. Mm. And I'm like, cool, I guess. I mean, that's fine. Like it's, yeah. it's 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 the music in their later life. I find, like Coldplay, is just fine. Yeah. It's not yellow. It's not anything of that. No. Mm. But I appreciate they're talented and they they adapted to stay successful throughout mm. their entire lives. But then again, a part of me is interested. Like, so what's lost though, when yeah. you try to stay relevant for that long? Yeah. Yeah. No, I th- I I I really like the documentary, and I think it's tough when you do have so much time to talk about and so many years to reflect on and like yeah then you come out with a three-hour documentary (laughs) which seems insane like to to watch but i do highly recommend it um uh we're coming to the end of our time here but you know what do you what no i i love the documentary i love the band and and everything so obviously i have yeah. That's going to be the interesting thing as we do these podcasts and we talk about the things that we, if it's something that we really love, you know, we I have a bias thing where the Eagles to me remind me of the relationships that I have with my family and with growing up. Like I listen to Take It Easy. I listen to um, Hotel California. I listen to a lot of those records. Um, my favorite, per- my personal favorite song is not even a song that was ever played in that entire documentary which is uh new kid in town it's one of the most beautiful songs i think they've ever made um and it just brings me back to a time where like i remember 
being young and growing up and uh it really hits home for a lot no, of yeah, things that's what music does but so what do you guys you know what, what, what are your takes from the documentary as we wrap the podcast go, up? Rick, go. <laughs> um there are there are definitely other music documentaries that i prefer mm-hmm. um it's always hard when you watch a movie being a being film school kid there's yeah. some things like i i agree that like parts of the film are like really well edited but a lot of it is very on the nose like when uh, there's a moment where somebody mentions somebody mentions one of the other members of the band and it just immediately cuts to the other guy mm-hmm. it's just like this remember this guy yeah which is understandable because i honestly i got confused because there's how many so, guys yeah, yeah. I I know, you know, <laughs> all white guys look the same yeah. so uh so yeah parts of it are like appreciated as a career it's pretty interesting um yeah yeah no no all right uh, for me no lie if it was not part of this podcast i probably would have never no i would have never, on this three never hour watched documentary. it yeah. but i do like what i got from it was i found it interesting again to see the perspectives of a band and what it takes to be a band and how like i don't know like trying to stay relevant in this industry and the music industry itself just like ruins you and also also can ruin yourself creatively like you could like just I keep it. It's weird that I kept on connecting with Felder because I felt like he wanted to be creative, and he wasn't allowed that. Yeah. Like that's mm-hmm. what I got to. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, at the end, I was. I don't think I'm the target audience for this film at all. No. Yeah. No, and that's the thing. Like yeah. I, I think the target audience is Eagles yeah. fans. Yeah. Because they produced it's, it. They're selling it on their website. They're, you know, it's yeah. an Eagles product. Yeah. Like for me, like I had to. There are things there that are very endearing to yeah. watch. But again, a lot of it too, like to get parts to the parts that weren't that enduring, you had to be really hardcore Eagles fan. Yeah. Like, like for me, three hours was long. Yeah, I could have done with oh, two. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. yeah I get it. <laughs> like it could have it could have been edited out a little bit more. Yeah, especially like the last hour is kind of like, I don't know. It just kind of went on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, yeah, I, just... I totally I totally agree. Um, but like like you said, for me, like if you're an Eagles fan, I would recommend it. But uh, there are other like much. Like, I've seen other kind of, like, concert films, and I think one of them was Gimme Shelter. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, like I think out of the concert films I've watched, that still is one of my favorite concert things, because it captures time, it's, it's Rolling yeah. Stones. Gimme Shel- Give yeah, Shelter it's is like def- historic. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. definitely more encapsulates historic in the time sort of thing. Yeah. Less about the band itself. Yeah. Because and of, I think that's what you know, I like. what I, happened. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think that's what I liked about it, because it had this kind of like hook to it yeah like natural story hook this yeah. one it was more the hook was the eagles like yeah. story yeah. wise there wasn't that much hook definitely yeah. yeah definitely yeah. it's it is more geared towards fans people that enjoy the music and want to know more about how it was created yeah. and what but i i will say like uh just closing this out i'm i'm a big fan of um knowing more story like i said at the beginning more and more knowing more stories about how things are made yeah and it's interesting then to hear how certain songs, like what's not the meaning behind it, but like what was the intention. Mm-hmm. And I like hearing that. So this doc, this documentary is definitely more for fans who want, who want to know more about the band or about the music itself. It's not really a foot reflection on the industry in, in like a grand scale. It does have context hit like, it, like deeper context about the industry and about working together in a band and the band dynamics um but yeah if, if you like the eagles watch it yeah. if you don't <laughs> maybe try to maybe be no. open and give it a no, try yeah, like, but yeah. if not then that's yeah. your choice and that's fine i mean i didn't i don't regret it it was entertaining but i like to point out like what you said keep in mind when watching it that it is framed from a certain lens it, yeah. it definitely is yeah. it, de- it definitely is it's not have i don't think it's like heavily biased because a lot of voices that are in that or the opposite voices are the opposite yeah. voices yeah. like Geffen. Geffen is probably the biggest one. I love th- um, those voices. Honestly, they kind of shake it off though. Yeah, they're like, yeah, that happened. <laughs> well, because he's like, then then I sued them. I have a lot of money. Why do I care anymore? Yeah. Like that's the thing. Like, like uh, was it Glenn Johns was like, yeah, I just let the other guy take the producing stuff. Was yeah, like, I was, yeah, I was, I was, done, I was done with them. Yeah, so. I was done with them. So whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Soda was mad though. He didn't get a lot of money. Like, I assume that the contracts made it have him less money than comparison to 
the driving forces. Like yeah, no, there's definitely yeah. there's definitely some people so in there that have that. there's yeah. some definitely some people in there that have like specific views, but then other people kind of are at least can be get to be very honest, and yeah. they're not they're not censored. I don't feel like they censored a lot of people, but um, like the filmmakers at least. But I think they did put it in a certain light towards the main guys. But no, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so check it out. Um, it's on Netflix, or I'm just gonna be honest. You can just look up YouTube. I, I, no, you. Uh, it's on uh, uh, Daily Motion. Yeah, which I think the, the link that I, I shared. Like, yeah. um, I just found it on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. You can higher quality. <laughs> like you can just find like I, I think when we talk about like where you can look at look and find stuff, we'll say like where the source is. But then. If it's you not know, there we anymore. live in an age of downloading and, and finding free online streams. So piracy's bad. Piracy's bad, but hey, you know it's out there. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> thank you for thank you for listening and listening to us to talk about this. Uh, next time, on the next episode, we're going to be watching uh, something that Roddy has prepared for yeah! us. What Ooh. what are we going to be watching? We're watching Mad Zika Woman. Man- it just got canceled, but still watch it. So Mad Zika Woman, the TV show, yeah. and it has. Jay Baruchel yeah, and Eric like, Andre in it. He's like a Canadian idol. Yeah, and you not picked, that Canadian idol. But grew like, up with that guy. Yeah, really. Yeah, and you have yeah, for kids. Woo! You picked two episodes for us to watch. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yes. So yeah, we'll be talking about that next time. And that's only forty minutes. <laughs> thanks, Roddy. You're welcome. Thanks, Roddy. <laughs> You're welcome. <guys. laughs> we'll see how long the podcast then is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, uh, make sure to. Uh, check out the podcast. It's available on SoundCloud and on iTunes and on Google Play. Um, and uh, also follow us on our social media stuff uh, yeah. because then you can find out more stuff that's happening. So thanks for listening, and uh, we'll oh yeah, this we'll check yeah, you out yeah. next time. So take care. Uh, bye bye. Bye bye. Peace.